What's up guys, it's Bromley, and today we're gonna go over how to hammer the triceps. I'm gonna take you through my uh, full upper body workout on my volume day, I'm gonna cover the split I'm on, and tell you what I've been doing to try to get these little baby ham hocks to grow. Sorry about this, I was drawing a hammer and I got carried away. I was getting flashbacks to my fifth set review, so uh, let's take care of this and we'll be going. All right, the first thing to take into account is the split you're on. Everybody's going to be on a different split. If you are a bodybuilder, you're going to be on a body part split. You're not going to be so lift oriented. Pretty much all the advice I'm ever going to give on my channel is going to have that emphasis where we're focusing on one particular thing. Remember, you always start big and move down the line, uh, heavier overloaded movement. So that works out well. If I have a competitive main movement, I have to get down. So I'm on a two, uh, two upper body day split. So I have two pressing movements that revolve around what I'm trying to get good at, and then I have to build everything else out around that to support that up. And in this case, that's my triceps. That's where the emphasis is going. So I follow a nine to 10 day split, which works fantastically well, saves my elbows, saves my shoulders, gives me enough recovery, but it's still a pretty high training frequency. It's certainly higher than uh, once every seven days, which a lot of people do. Um, and I'm on a uh, volume and intensity dynamic. So in a nine to 10 day training week. I have one day for volume, one day for intensity. Intensity is more specific. Volume is a little less specific and a lot more fluff, uh, lighter weight, uh, more isolation work. Uh, really just trying to add some extra volume to kind of round myself out. All right, for exercise selection, uh, I start out with a big one, close grip board benches. This is a theme we're going to talk about today, disadvantaging the elbow. That is how you get your triceps activated. You don't need a magical exercise. Close grip, presses, put more range in the elbow so you can load in the limited range. You don't need to break your wrist trying to get down to your chest. It's unnecessary. And the limited range and stopping on the, the, the bench block, it's actually a little easier on my shoulder. So it helps out with all the different pressing variations I'm trying to do. And it's targeting what I'm trying to target. Military presses add extra volume because uh, overhead pressing is my primary concern right now. So I have some overhead twice a week. Dips, you're not going to do a lot better for tricep development than dips, and I'm going to go over how I like to do those. More limited range of motion, keeping the strain on my triceps, feeling the squeeze, not tearing my shoulders up with a lot of straight weight. I'm not strapping 200 pounds to my body. I'm using bands, I'm using uh, tempo squeeze technique, uh, and that works very well. And then I got my isolation. Press downs and uh, dumbbell skull crushers are going to finish my triceps off. The rest is general stuff, hammer curls, little bicep work, rear delt work to keep my press rounded out. But this is very, very, very heavy on the triceps for one reason and one reason only. It's a lot of work that disadvantages the elbow. That's really all you have to do. So then you have to know your rate of progression. Now, if you're trying to target a weak area, volume should be the first thing to start with, just simply doing more work. That's gonna give you the most, uh, the most play in the joints. That'll give you the most options as far as how to maneuver forward. Don't worry about looking for magical exercises. Don't worry about trying to go as hard as you can, at least not yet. Uh, just set a baseline of work and seek to move forward. So we start with a substantial amount of sets. If you're doing a myriad of exercises, about five sets, that's a lot. Over six, seven, eight exercises, that's gonna be a lot of volume. You don't need to go much higher than that, or it might be counterproductive. So I there, there's two different things I like to do. An RPE-based progression where I work up to a top set, let's say RPE seven, and I can fill that in with whatever. The heavier stuff, I might go a top set of five. Uh, things that are lighter or I want more full range of motion for growth purposes, I might go eight or 10 reps. And then I'll do a back off set. A back off set, you can either drop weight and keep the reps the same. So a top set of five, drop weight, multiple sets of five. Um, or you can keep the weight the same and do fewer reps. So I might do a top set of 10 and then repeat with fives or sixes after that. As long as I'm getting, it's a lot of sub max work. As long as I'm getting a lot of sets in, that works well for the compound stuff. As soon as we get away from the main movements and their variations, then we just work in a range. It's the easiest thing in the world. Give yourself a number of sets and a rep range to work in. And all you have to do is as time goes on, you can go a little heavier or you can do more of your work at a heavier weight. You can work up and down in that eight to 12 rep range in this example. And maybe your next workout, you're doing more sets of eight than you are sets of 12. Maybe you take that weight after a couple weeks and you try to do that for 10 or 12. You have a lot of wiggle room. You know, if you have a good week, you can do five sets instead. Maybe the week after you do four sets, you do a heavier. You can meander. It doesn't have to be a set progression. You should not be trying to set PRs. Use the weight to work within the range and to fill out more work over time. It's the easiest thing in the world. Don't overthink it. Stress just has to tick up over time. That's the only thing that matters. 
So everything we just went over covers a mesocycle. It's gonna be something you're doing for a few weeks back to back. Uh, after you get about four or five run-throughs of that split for a weekly training cycle, then you wanna move on to another mesocycle. All you have to do, change either the movements, you can alter the rep ranges, you can use advanced fatigue techniques for the volume emphasis on a weak body part like your triceps, it's super easy. If you're going from, let's say, four or five sets, eight, 12, 15 reps, whatever your range is, then you can start to get more aggressive and add intensity. So advanced fatigue techniques might be on your last set of press downs, you do a running drop set, or you start to utilize supersets, or you do, let's say, partial ranges of motion, like 21s, or you do occlusion training, you do something like that. Um, the easiest thing to do is just cycle through different movements, wash, rinse, repeat. Remember starting back on that dirt road and driving forward. But you always have so many variations that you can pull from. You don't have to go crazy. You're trying to follow elaborate set and rep schemes. Pull back, set a new baseline of work, roll forward. After five, six weeks, pull back, set a new baseline of work, roll forward. It's the easiest thing in the world. So the first important piece is going to be getting yourself warmed up. No matter what you do, you want to have the joints warmed. You want to have a lot of blood moving around because there's going to be some load involved. So keep yourself healthy. One of the tricks I like to use is to take some of the smaller accessory movements you might put at the end that you might be inclined to, let's say, neglect or skip when you're tired. Start with those. It's a good way to get your heart rate up, get yourself psychologically prepared for some of the bigger stuff. And it, it feels like the workout goes faster because when you start adding up the smaller stuff that you really don't look forward to, everything just, just takes forever to get through. So the two I like to use on these volume days, I'm, I'm focusing on my rear delts, my uh, rotator cuff, my rhomboids, my traps. So I really like bent raises with a dumbbell and I really like uh, seated dumbbell cleans. With a dumbbell clean, uh, it's not like an Olympic clean. You're not trying to build explosiveness through your legs. You perform essentially an upright row into an external rotation. I like to lean forward at about a 20 degree angle and I just feel it more in my rear delts and uh, in my rhomboid. So I really like it. It's not about load here. It's not about pushing the weight. It's about establishing a baseline of work. Just get your reps in, move quickly. You don't even need to keep adding weight. Just make sure you get those reps in, add another set here or there, increase the rep count here or there. When you filled out that dumbbell, then jump the next five pounds and you can carry that on for a long time. So you don't have to progress it as aggressively. Uh, the main movement that I picked for this workout, because remember, I'm emphasizing my triceps. This is my general volume day. I'm doing the strict pressing as a way to get extra overhead volume in a little later, but I really want to hammer my triceps, so I start with the biggest tricep mover. I went with a board press because elevated presses are a little easier on my shoulder, especially in the face of all of the overhead pressing I'm doing. Um, any lockout movement that limits you to the to the top end of the movement is going to be fantastic. It's going to be great for taxing the triceps um, because that is where the triceps are involved the most, the top end of the press, and it disadvantages uh, the elbow. So by going close grip, I'm exaggerating that disadvantage. So my triceps are now really coming into play and I can focus on positioning, feeling myself load into them. And I do this kind of flossing movement where, uh, and competitive lifters do this. When I'm trying to do a lot of reps or if I'm trying to isolate uh, my triceps and my lockout, I really focus on pushing the bar away from me, feeling my triceps squeeze. So I'm keeping uh, the part of my triceps that's attached to the scapula pinned back and I'm flossing myself, almost pushing myself back into the bench in a straight line to get that lockout, to get that squeeze in the back of my arms. And it, it works fantastically well as the reps accumulate. I mean, I fatigue very fast, especially I went through this really short rest period on my back down set. And that's what I think about when I'm going for weight in a bench press, I do the opposite. I actually arch that or arc that bar back over my face because that's a mechanically advantaged position. This I'm trying to target a particular muscle. So by locking my uh, tricep down at my scapula, by locking that part of the tricep insertion down and then flossing it, uh, it through that lockout and really emphasizing my elbows getting in, the conditions really good habits because that's how I want to visualize my lockout. I don't want to lose shoulder. I want to lead with my elbow the same way you lead with your hips scooping your hips into a deadlift lockout. I'm scooping my elbows into the lockout. So this movement is really great. Again, easy on my shoulders, disadvantage the elbow. I get a lot of overload. I can progress this linearly for quite a few weeks and I don't have to worry about blasting my triceps. I just have to get through the movement and the disadvantage does the rest. So I fatigued really quick here. I worked up to 325 for a pretty easy five. I, again, Dirt road analogy, give yourself room. Give yourself room to progress over the next three, four, five weeks if you're doing the same exercises. Back up 
and then start again. That's how you stack your mesocycles. So I give myself a runway. You want to build momentum. So pretty easy five. I'll be able to add 20 or so pounds every week for quite a while. Uh, then I went down to my back offs for the same rep count, five sets of five at 285. And again, I made a point. I'm not focused on load. I'm not going maximal. Feel the triceps engage, feel positioning, feel myself load, short rest break and squeeze. Be aware of the movement. And it was so effective that I actually racked it before the last rep because I wasn't sure I was going to be able to lock it out. My triceps got torched pretty fast and that was without any advanced fatigue movements. So skipping the drop sets and all the, the advanced stuff like that, we get into the overhead press and this is just token volume. This is just a second day for me to get some token volume overhead. My heavy intensity day, that's all the log presses, the standing pin presses. That's a very specific technical contest oriented stuff. This is just to pad some, get some extra muscle growth, pad some volume in my training. So again, I'm going light. I'm trying to build a baseline of work that I can aggressively build off of for a period of time before I reset or before I take a deload. So I, uh, the protocol I'm doing here is a top set of 10, easy RP, RP seven or so. So, you know, 13, 14, 15 rep max or something. And then I continue on with sets of six. So I'm already a little fatigued and I was able to just clear these out. Now, something I started doing today, which was a little interesting, I always uh, arc the overhead press back over my head because it makes sense. That's the mechanically uh, strongest position, but it always felt awkward. I actually found here with that flossing movement I was doing in the bench that if I just leaned back and if I just glided my elbows through, almost pressing it out in front, not quite to where I lose it, but kind of leaning back and, and pressing myself back as I lock the weight out, my lockout was a lot more secure. I'm probably going to do most of my overhead pressing like that. It felt more efficient uh, and it felt like my potential to handle weight was quite a bit heavier. So I'm definitely going to look into that. So I was able to keep 205. I mean, I'm good for, for 225 next week. I think I'll be up around 275 by the end of this run, given the way this felt right now. And that's about where I've been in the past. I think in the past, I hit like 275 for eight when I was really doing a ton of strict pressing. But I tend to get limited by how my shoulders or how my tendons get eaten up. I've never been on a split like this before. So this nine, 10 day split, I'm really banking is gonna keep that at bay. I mean, those couple extra days of recovery have been huge for me so far. And I credit a lot of my success this year to that because that's really the only difference. Okay, so now we got our big main movements. We got our heavy overloaded movement for a lot of volume. We got our strict pressing for a lot of volume. Then we're going to the rest of the pressing variations that aren't mechanically as similar. Uh, they're a little more varied. Dips are a favorite of mine. And then after that, we're going to go into the isolation stuff uh, with it, with things like dips and other presses. I mean, if I was doing dumbbell work, let's say dumbbell floor presses or incline dumbbell presses, or if I was doing some Swiss bar, something, if uh, a machine press, I really like to use mini bands because they're easy to set up. You can fix them to machines. You can fix them to dumbbells. And especially if I'm trying to target my triceps, it takes a lot of load off the elbows because the most disadvantaged part of the movement, that's where you get that, that inflammation, that pain, that tendinopathy that sinks in, that kills your skull crushers, kills your French presses. So by deloading at the bottom and getting the load at the top, you can do a lot more work. You can torch the triceps very effectively and it's very specific to your lockout, which is why you want strong triceps. So I started throwing bands in for dips and I throw this mini band on and it's great. You feel very strong. I mean, you're conditioning yourself to lock out quickly. Uh, if I'm working that squeeze, oh man, it works works fantastically well. Man, I really need to get I need to get a spray tan. I was looking forward to looking all jacked on camera, and you can barely see you can barely see any definition, man. I'm too I look like somebody green screened me out. I'm I'm too pasty here. So anyways, so I really like accommodating resistance. Um, chains are good too. Josh Bryant shows a lot of his guys doing things like skull crushers and curls and raises with chains. I love that. It's a little more of a pain in the ass to set up. That works very well. Uh, so I keep the dips simple. I used to do weighted dips and I think I'm sticking with bands from now on just because the weighted dips are again, hard on the shoulder joint, hard on the tendons. If I'm doing a lot of benching and a lot of overhead pressing, something's gotta give. So this little bit of recovery goes a long way. So I'm a big fan of that. Um, Four sets of 12, uh, sorry, four sets of eight to 12. So I decided to throw the heavy band on for one of the sets, do eight. Uh, I mean, I can clip that off for 12s next time and I know that, and that's how we keep things going up. These progressions, and I wanna be clear, I'm in a static progression right now. I call, it's my terminology, none of you are gonna know what the hell that means. I think of static progressions as ones where you have a set period of work and you're just doing that for a period of time, four weeks, couple months, whatever. Uh, it's how I think of off-season training. It's usually RPE driven. 
I'm not worried about changing the volume each week. I'm not worried about fix, uh, fixating on some progression of percentages each week. I'm not worried about any of that. I just have my amount of work. I start out at the uh, this at a set RPE. It's kind of easy. I just get through the minimum amount each week. I only go up if I feel like I can handle it. If if I've gotten stronger, that RPE at the that same RPE is going to be more weight, or it's going to be another set. So it's very intuitive. I'm always, always, always far away from failure. I never let myself get there. I'm more inclined to use adding a set or or if I have a range like the dips, perfect example, four sets, eight to 12. Starting out, I went kind of heavy. I did a set of eight, drop back body weight for set of 12. Maybe next time I meander up and I fill that range out by doing all 12s with the heavy band. And you find interesting ways intuitively to just do more work without just going harder and harder and harder. It's a couple more reps if you feel like it. It's a couple more sets if you feel like it. If it's a set range, I'm just filling that range out more towards the top with the heavier weight option as I adapt to it. So there's a lot of options. I'm not in trying to PR on every single exercise because that doesn't happen. And there might be times where you feel really good in the beginning and on the back end, you just don't have it in you. So going into the isolation work at this point, my triceps were blown up and I didn't get close to failure on anything. I mean, I, I racked that one bench rep before I was supposed to finish. But again, that was me avoiding failure. And my triceps are blown up. There's more volume I've handled in a very long time. So I decided to go to dumbbell skull crushers, which I'm a fan of. I like them better than barbell skull crushers. And I use the fat grips here. So there's something called uh, irradiation. Pavel talked about it in one of his books. I think it's called Sherrington's Law of Irradiation. The idea is that if the surrounding musculature, you know, close to some muscle that you're focused on, is squeezed and contracted, that that nerve impulse uh, action actually makes that primary muscle stronger. So the idea is like if you squeeze your fist, well, the harder you squeeze your fist, you're gonna feel your forearm muscles, of course, but then you're gonna feel your bicep and tricep. And as you squeeze harder and harder, you might even feel your shoulder and lat. Everything recruits to stabilize. So you can do that with, let's say, your midsection while you're trying to uh, you know, do standing work or, or deadlift or squat. Uh, and you can do it with upper body stuff. So I like the fat grips because with the open hand, I can squeeze, it's extra grip stimulus. For those of you that don't do dumbbells on a regular basis, your grip and forearms are missing out. I avoided them for years and I regret it. But it, it's a little harder on your forearms, so that's nice. But it allows you to squeeze and I immediately feel all the musculature through my arm work harder, get tighter. Uh, stability in my shoulder, it's a big one I'm after. I think I've had some labrum issues, make it slide around. So everything I can do that locks in. So on these dumbbell skull crushers, on these hammer curls, uh, this is just token work to keep my forearms, my uh, elbows, my biceps rounded out. Uh, but the fat grips work really well. I am a big fan of those. And actually my elbows feel a little bit better when I use them, if I'm being honest here. So last thing, we go to the press down. Uh, Again, you move from big to small. That's generally how this stuff goes. Overloaded movements first. Uh, I would say more range, movements with more range and more volume after. And then you get to the smaller, less similar movements uh, that aren't just barbell variations, but are machines or dumbbells or, or something like, again, dips. It'd be like good mornings with the deadlift. Then you go to the very small stuff, the isolation stuff. That's where we do the press down. And that's where we just make it make the muscle scream. That's where we get the highest amount of effort. You can really go hard on these. Uh, again, I don't like to use advanced fatigue techniques until later on. I'm going to save those in my back, keep those in my back pocket. For now, all I have to do is get a consistent amount of work in here and build off of it in a logical fashion. I started out light enough today, just general fatigue from everything together got to me. So as I condition to that, I'll be able to go higher plates. I'll be more fresh by the time I get here. And that's gonna compound it in more and more stress. So I'm just doing a few sets of 20, just getting blood in. Again, focusing on the squeeze, that's all I need. I don't need to go to failure. I don't need to break myself in half. Not a single thing here went to that point. In four or five weeks when I need to rotate through, I can add a drop set at the end and it will tear me up. I can add a super set. I could do 21s. I could do occlusion stuff. I have all these options for advanced fatigue techniques. Right now I'm just building out a base. Easy peasy, get the minimum amount of work in every week. Just roll it forward a little more where you can. Don't force it. Don't try to throw more. Don't make that 10 pound weight jump on the dumbbell. If you're gonna, if your movement pattern's gonna go to hell, don't run into that brick wall. I'll give you time to move around. So this is really how I, uh, how I 
towards the triceps. I finish off with some uh, cable curls and I do a stretch to get my delts uh, loosened up. Just watching this video, I can see where my front delt, you see it's a lot bigger and it internally rotates my shoulders, which can be kind of a problem. I've had that for a long time. So I try to do little things to keep my shoulders, my pecs loosened up so they don't get too bound. And this is a good one. Actually, if you do it after you get a bicep pump, it, it kills, <laughs> it burns pretty well. So that was pretty much it. Remember, you structure your workout. I'm always going to do it in the context of a main lift. So I start with the main lift, then variations that will help me, then the bodybuilding stuff that's gonna round me out. Big to small, okay, overloaded to uh, less load, more volume to smaller and smaller movements. And all you do is just wave back and forth. It's very easy. Always start way back, give yourself room to move forward. To hit the triceps, all you gotta do, it's easy as this, disadvantage the elbow. That's it, that's all you have to do. It doesn't have to be a magic movement. It doesn't have to be something where you do it, you're like, oh my God, my triceps are cramping up so hard. Some movements might do that, but you don't need that. You just need more work with movements that disadvantage the elbow. Stick to it, be consistent, and that'll come. So thanks for watching, guys. Uh, this was my press workout. I don't know, maybe check back in two months. See if, see if my baby triceps have gotten any bigger. Maybe I've set a log record by then, who knows. Uh, but until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.